morning. Happy Sabbath. It's good to see you all here this morning. Uh, as we're getting set up here, just a reminder, uh, we will be here tomorrow at 11 for another presentation. For those of you who approached me, is this on, by the way? Can you hear me okay? Okay, so to make sure. For those of you who enjoyed the monster discussion yesterday, I have two new messages I, I have not delivered yet, so it's new content. It hasn't been on the podcast, and I have it all. Tomorrow at 11 o'clock, I'm going to have a talk called Ghost Church, which I think, you know, like, like woo or something. I'm going to say like, something like that. Ghost Church. There you go. That's right. And then Monday morning, I know it's rough, Monday morning at 9, but if I can get up, you can get up, and we're going to do something. I, I'm going to, I'm going to lead you through a talk called Looking for Lilith. A few weeks, uh, a few months ago, I had something strange happen in Sabbath school that involved Adam's alleged first wife, Lilith, not Eve. Heard of this before, but it's going to be a weird story. I think you'll enjoy it. So, Monday morning, we'll talk about that. But this morning, we have a different topic, and I invite you to pray with me before we get into God's Word together this morning. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the beautiful sunshine again, the wonderful weather, and so many people, so many of your people gathered together here to worship and learn and study and sing and just fellowship together. As we get into this message, I pray that you anoint my heart and my mind as I deliver your word. Please. Fill us with your Holy Spirit as we are often distracted and anxious and our minds can wander. Help us to focus in on this moment and to get something from this message that is uniquely for us. You've called each and every one of us to a unique ministry, to make unique music with our lives. And I pray that they, all of us will feel affirmed in what we've been called to do, that we will feel validated and hopefully a little bit better understood as we all seek to give our un unique gifts and ministry and voices to you. In precious name we pray, amen. We have been told that there was a group of people just up the road from our church in Michigan that desperately craved human contact. We had been told that this tragic group of people had very little family, even fewer visitors, and a completely open schedule. Day after day, we've been told these people longed for some form of stimulation, diversion, entertainment, anything to help pass the time in their monotonous, joyless existence. And if we were willing, we're told, if we were willing to come out on a Sabbath afternoon to sing some hymns a cappella to this group of lost souls, they would be eternally grateful. Now you have to understand something. I am an E-list worship leader. You have your A-list worship leader. That's what we have today, right? Amen. Good music. B-list is if someone gets sick. C list, D list, and then there's E list. That's me. For E for emergency use only. I can play guitar, but I don't practice or keep up with it. I'm not a bad singer, but I'm not a good singer. I'm a functional singer. If there is no other hope, no other option, I don't like it, I'm uncomfortable, but I can step in and I can lead a little worship. Preferably a small one around a campfire, not in front of a large group of people. But because we've been told this group was so pitiful, I agreed, okay, I will go with this group on Sabbath afternoon to this assisted living home up the road, and I will sing some a cappella hymns with these four or five other people. We arrived at the assisted living home, and everyone gathered into the recreation area. People of different ages, different disabilities and conditions, made their way in. People with canes, walkers, wheelchairs, all made their way in, sat down, and based on their countenance, what we had been told was true. They beamed at us. They were so delighted and grateful we were there. And then we began to sing. Halfway through the first stanza of hymn, number 627, Jacob's Ladder, the woman 
in the wheelchair to my right, gripped her wheels, spun around at light speed, 180 degrees with the precision and technique of a NASCAR driver. It began to race towards the exit while shouting, help, help, someone get me out of here. Do you understand when you already have musical self-esteem what it does to you? When somebody in your audience turns around and makes for the exit while literally crying out for deliverance. And we still have three more stanzas to go. Why are there four stanzas for Jacob's ladder? That's a long ladder. That's an extension ladder. We needed an escalator to get off. You know, we needed to end the whole thing. Not everyone will understand or appreciate the music you make with your life. I'll say it one more time. Not everyone will understand or appreciate the music you make with your life. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 11, 16 to 17. The context of this passage is Jesus, Jesus' good buddy, John the Baptist, is in prison. And John is having a crisis of faith. Happens to the best of us, right? He's wondering, are, are you the guy that I've been preaching about, we've been hoping for, are you somebody else? When you get into certain life circumstances, even the most faithful have some questions. There's no shame when it comes to doubt. We all have doubt sometimes. So John sends his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the guy? And Jesus sends the disciples back, and you, John's disciples says, you tell them, the blind see, the lame walk, Hope is restored. Good things are happening. I'm, I'm the Savior. You can have hope. Sends John's disciples back. And then Jesus turns to the crowd that's gathering, and he, and he focuses on them. And he says, I tell you truly, among those born of women, there is none greater than John the Baptist. Now think about that. For those of you this morning who might be struggling with your faith, Jesus said there's none greater than John the Baptist, and even he was having a faith struggle. So just because you're struggling with your faith this morning does not mean you're unspiritual and you're not a follower of Jesus. You're okay. Jesus says, there's no one greater, and yet the least of these enter the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus pivots, and it's kind of a weird thing. The first time I read this, I thought it was kind of a strange thing to, to shift to. Jesus defends his friend, says the least of these enter the kingdom of heaven, and then he starts talking about this generation. And here's what he says. But to what will I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. I always thought, that's kind of a weird pivot. What are we talking about? It's this image of children in the marketplace annoying each other with songs and games. When you grow up, and I know it's sort of a global thing, growing up, when you're in elementary school and you're a little kid, there's always these song games, there's these nursery rhymes, there's these little silly limericks and games that you play in school that you annoy each other with. We had annoying songs growing up. I remember if you showed any affection to a member of the opposite sex before the age of 12. Your classmates would take your name and their name and put him in a tree where you are K-I-S-S-I-N-G. And then there was something about love and marriage and a baby carriage that would follow. Stupid little rhyme. You had to be careful. You didn't want to sit too close to a girl. You, know, you didn't want to touch a girl at that point because you would be the subject of rhymes. Jesus is saying, and when you dig into the context of this passage, he's like, it's like little kids saying, we were make-believing funeral, and you wouldn't mourn with us. And, or, and then we made believe wedding, and you wouldn't sing and dance with us. What on earth are we talking about here? Jesus, if you keep reading, you'll find out. Jesus is contrasting his ministry with John the Baptist's ministry and how the ministry music critics heard what they were doing. We go to verse 18. For John... Baptist came neither eating or drinking, and they said, he has a demon. And the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they said, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus is contrasting John the Baptist's ministry and his own ministry and how the generation of critics in that day heard the different tones of what they were doing. So we start with John. For many people, John was too serious, too austere too solemn. He was like a funeral dirge, and no one wanted to mourn with him. 
You're too somber, man. You're too serious. You, you keep saying things like repent and you're grieved. You should be happier. Right? As believers, we should be happy. If you have God, how can you be sad? We teach young children this from a very young age. If you have faith, if, you have, if you're a Christian, if you have Jesus, you shouldn't be sad. It should be joyful and happy all the time. We actually teach children this in a song very, very early on. I'm not going to sing it to you because I told you before, I'm an E-list worship leader, and I don't need anyone crying out for deliverance and running to the adult meeting. That's not what's going to happen. So I'm going to speak it to you, and you tell me if you've heard this song that we teach to children. I'm in right, out right, upright, downright, happy. All how, how much of the time? All the time. All the time. And we have gestures that go along with it. And to drive home the point, I heard, already heard some people, it's an involuntary action because you've been indoctrinated. We, we have to clap out those last syllables just to, just to emphasize it. I'm in right, out right, up right, down right, happy all the time, right? Can you imagine? Try that the next time someone is, is sharing a moment of grief and trauma and loss. Uh, the world is so bad and I'm discouraged and I'm happy all the time. Try it. See what happens. You're going to go from happy to slappy real quick. Modern Christians, even more than ancient Christians, have a hard time dealing with negative emotions. We don't like anxiety. We don't want sadness. We don't want complication. We want things to be shiny. We want things to be happy. We're not equipped to deal with, with confused, awkward feelings. We want people to stay positive. Just pray reality away. Hide it. Fake it. Let me enjoy my potluck in peace, right? I don't want to hear about it. Just be happy. Christians have been influenced by a variety of things. Part of it's the prosperity gospel. Part of it is our modern technology and culture that allows us to escape any negative feeling or pain. We can just pretend it's not there. We can distract ourselves with it. Some of it is what's called toxic positivity. Happy all the time. Nothing's ever bad. Everything's happy. It's like you gaslight yourself. Everything's great. Everything's fine. There's a meme, I think, online of a dog sitting in a burning office, just sitting there. This is fine. Everything is fine. Christian, the Christian faith should be shiny and happy with good stage lighting, well-coiffed hair, skinny jeans, and a latte in hand all the time. And I'm here to remind you that not even Jesus was happy all the time. One of my former associate pastors used to love to say, there's a lot of pictures of Jesus in the Bible. He's not smiling in all of them. And for those of you today who find that your life's music and your life's ministry is more lament than loud rejoicing, it's more weeping and sadness and speaking out against injustice and abuse, which sometimes the happier Christians interpret as unspiritual, disrespectful and political. But if you find yourself more lamenting today, it's important to remind those of us who are happy. Just because we're in a season of happiness and blessing doesn't mean everybody else is. And we often need to be reminded that just because we're thriving doesn't mean our neighbor is. And that tone of music, the John the Baptist tone, is just as valid as the happier ones. Which brings us to Jesus. For some, we look at them as you're too sad. And then for those of us who might be melancholy, those of us who speak out against injustice and weep, and we're, we have those sort of sad, anxious tones, we look at the people who are happy and think, you are far too happy. Far too happy to be a Christian. How can you be happy with all the things that are going on? Jesus says his ministry was like a wedding song. But no one would sing and no one would dance. His critics looked at him and thought, this is, this is, is too much. You are too happy. You are too indulgent. You are too bougie, too blessed to be a genuine believer. Jesus' work was not heard or seen by the critics as being full of preaching and healing. It was your eating. And you're drinking too much with the wrong people. I love that. Just think about that for a second. Those of you who maybe have grown up with more of an austere approach to faith. 
where things are a little more restrained. Jesus was accused by church people of having too much of a good time. You eat too much, you drink too much, with the wrong people, which tells me you can be a follower of Jesus and be accused of having a good time. There's several authors, I love it, they said the gospel is Jesus eating bad food, or excuse me, eating good food with bad people. Having a good time with bad people, that's the gospel. And it was offensive to them, they could not understand it. It made no sense. How can you be that happy? And so I have to say something to the joy hunters and the worship police and the revival taxonomists who haven't sung a happy tune in so long they have forgotten what one sounds like. So when they do hear one, it sounds like the devil. It's good to remember that just because you are not in a season of joy and blessing doesn't give you the right to steal it from somebody else. We are, at least in the, at least in the U.S., I don't know, maybe it's similar here, we're in a cultural mood of deconstruction. People are deconstructing their faith. Taking it apart, looking at it, and often what happens in this process of deconstruction, deconstruction becomes something destructive. When you understand the origins of this idea of deconstruction, you understand that it's a positive exercise. It was designed to be a positive exercise. We inherit, we inherit these things in life, and then we take them apart, like a child taking apart a toy to see how it works. We take things like our faith, what is good? And what have I been taught that maybe is not so good? Happy all the time. Maybe that theology, maybe I need to put that away. Maybe that's not totally accurate. And it's frightening for people. We have movements called exangelical. Of course, we have former Adventists, former Christians, or people who say, I, I, I'm spiritual. I still feel connected to Christ, but not the church. And they're in this season of taking things apart. It's good to remind some of us who are in the middle of that deconstructive work. A philosopher throw this on the screen, the philosopher who is credited for being the father of deconstruction, Jacques Derrida, continental philosopher, has gone on record many, many times, and he says, deconstruction, let's say it one more time, is not demolition or destruction. It's not demolition or destruction. When we get into deconstruction, those of us who are in this sad, melancholy thing, judging those who are happy, and we're in this middle of this deconstruction, what it's meant to be is taking what we've inherited and saying, what have I not heard? What are the voices that have not been heard? The perspectives I have not considered. Taking it apart to construct something positive. And it's easy for those of us sometimes who are happy to judge those who are deconstructing and those who are deconstructing to look at those of us who are still enjoying our faith and, and, and judge each other and not understand each other. Here's the thing. Seventh-day Adventists were deconstructionists long before it was cool and long before Jacques Derrida. Think about what Adventists have done. We took Sunday worship, and we deconstructed it, and we came up with the Sabbath. We took this idea of the immortal soul, and you die and go right to heaven or hell. We deconstructed that and have now conditionalist immortality. We have a different state of the dead doctrine. At a time when it was believed that spiritual gifts were no longer active, we deconstructed that and said, no, the spirit of prophecy is still active. We find it in a young woman here. Let's make space for her to speak. Let's throw this one on the screen. We took taco salad. And we deconstructed it, and we came up with a haystack. We deconstruct as Adventists, and we start, and, and we don't, may not want to admit it, we appreciate when other people deconstruct things. Throw this on the screen. We had hamburger, and now we have fries. Someone deconstructed and made veggie burger. So deconstruction is not a bad thing. And here's the thing. There is reason to deconstruct. The digital age has shown us more religious abuse, and traumatized voices than we ever thought imaginable. And we absolutely have a mission to deconstruct abusive systems and toxic voices who claim to represent Christianity. Full stop. And it's hard in the middle of deconstruction to understand how someone can be happy with traditional expressions of faith, still singing hymns that resonate with them, still being willing to say, Happy Sabbath. How can you have a happy Sabbath with all that's going on in the world? It's hard for some people to understand how you can be a cheerful giver, how you can enjoy serving at a local church, especially on a committee. But even in hard times, and catch this, 
we look at the life of Jesus, what he models, even in hard times and end times, you can still have good times. You can still have a good times and hard times and good times in the end times. Don't feel ashamed of your blessings and your joy. One of my former professors said, don't let anybody steal your joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Refuse to feel guilty. Now, what you might want to do is notice and look around those of us who are happy and blessed. If you see somebody who is not being blessed and you've got a lot of blessings, what should you do? Share it. Try to elevate them, lift them up so we can all rejoice and be happy. We often don't understand one another's voices. We don't understand the music we make with each other's lives. There's the voices that cry in the wilderness. Make, cro- make, make straight the crooked paths. Like, Ooh, that's harsh. That's not really my vibe right now. And those people look at those of us who are having these, 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 the gentle voice, like, like the shepherd calling the sheep, let's rest and relax and eat. I don't understand that. How can you be doing it? We don't understand each other. So we need to understand each other, need to listen to each other, and maybe even join in together with each other's songs. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I find myself, when, I, when I'm in class, when I'm doing sermons, I'm increasingly in Corinthians. I think, at least at this moment, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians are my favorite letters. Paul writes several letters in the New Testament trying to correct people. Every church is having, it's so funny because sometimes as Christians we'll be like, we need to get back to New Testament Christianity and we forget the fact that the New Testament church is also dysfunctional. And have you noticed that some churches get more than one letter? Corinthians gets two and we actually believe there was a third letter, but we've lost it. This church is fighting over who is more spiritual, who is better, whose gifts are better. And Paul is trying to bring these people together to understand that you're different but you're all a part of the same body. Verse 12. For just as the body is one, has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are, are one body, so it is with Christ. Let's skip down to verse 14. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make, any le- make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. I want to use some theological imagination. And I want to take this passage in Matthew, combine it with the passage in 1 Corinthians 12, and I want to create my own metaphor that I think is in the same spirit of of this. We are the choir of Christ. All of us with different, unique voices, but somehow he can bring us together and we can harmonize. Some of us have different ranges. Some of us are comfortable singing solo. Some of us need accompaniment. Some of us need a lot of accompaniment. Some prefer quartets. And some have different styles. Some of us have voices, the music we make with our life, that has tremendous range, like an angelic choir. Some of us tend to be a little romantic. We we drift more towards the lovey-dovey things, like Solomon. Some of us weep and lament call out injustice like Jeremiah does in Lamentations. Some of us aren't that great at music, but we're silly. We love silly songs, little poems, like the one that Samson wrote about taking the job of a donkey and killing a thousand people. You can read about it. It's not that well written. It's not clever. It doesn't rhyme, at least not in English, but it seems on brand. It's sort of the thing I would picture Samson writing. Some of us sound like the emergency broadcast system. We are loud, we are shrill, and you're annoying, by the way. But you're just like the minor prophets. We may not want to hear from you, but we need to hear from you because you're the ones who tell us the danger that's coming that we need to pay attention to. Just don't do it all the time, right? Some of us are a little edgy. Might be alternative. Make some... People who more like more classical things uncomfortable. That's okay too if you're edgy. At the triumphal entry, Jesus indicated under certain circumstances he would allow rock music. 
about that one. If you don't praise, these rocks are going to cry out. Think about some of the psalms that King David wrote. There are psalms that he wrote that we do not teach to children as memory verses. So it's okay if you find yourself being a little edgy, a little cutting edge. Paul concludes his metaphor, and I think it's important for us to hear this too. If one member suffers, this is in verse 26, we'll throw this on the screen. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice with it. If one voice laments, we learn to lament with them. If one person sings praise, we learn to praise with them. So instead of criticizing the melancholy voices or deconstructing the joyful voices and anything in between that we that we find, we begin by listening to them, seeking to understand them, maybe even joining in solidarity. Lament with those who lament and rejoice with those who rejoice. All of you are part of the choir of Christ. The last five psalms in the book of Psalms are all about praise, and it culminates with Psalm 150, the final psalm, and it calls upon us to praise God in the sanctuary, praise God in heaven, praise Him with every instrument, including the pipe, I'm so sorry, my fellow Sunday Adventists, in dancing. Two instruments that Jesus mentions in Matthew 11 that people didn't respond to. Thirteen times in Psalm 150, there is this call, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Thirteen times it repeats which means that even repetitive praise songs can be inspired. The Psalms ends its list of instruments and the entire book with a call for everything that has breath to praise the Lord, an inclusive call to all of us, no matter how unique or different, happy or sad, Somewhat, somewhere in the middle where your voice is at, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. God's playlist is far more diverse and nuanced than we could ever imagine. Which brings up this issue. If we are all called to praise, what about those if you're in a season of lament? Lament and praise aren't the same thing, but here's the thing. They are related. It's because you can't get to Psalm 150 without passing through Psalm 22's, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You can't get to Psalm 150 without Psalm 23's valley of the shadow of death. You can't get to Psalm 150 without Psalm 79's request for wrath to be poured out or Psalm 137's call to, quote, dash the little ones against the rocks. Let voices be heard. Let them come together. Don't silence the music you don't understand or the voices you can't yet relate to because if Jesus' words in Matthew 11 are true, those might be the voices you need to hear. Those might be the voices that correct the direction of the church. Just because people don't understand or appreciate the music you make with your life doesn't mean God hasn't God doesn't understand it or appreciate it or hasn't designed it and called you to make it. Just because we don't understand how or why other people make the music they do doesn't mean it's any less inspired than the music we make. So in conclusion, I want to exhort you to listen Seek to understand and join in solidarity with the Spirit. The Spirit-led songs that other people sing, even if they're different from you. Make room for all the voices. And let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the diversity, the uniqueness, and the challenging nature of the voices we have in the body of Christ, in your choir. Sometimes we hear the music other people make with their life and it's confusing, it doesn't match ours and we don't understand it and we are so quick to dismiss it. Just like the religious leaders did with John the Baptist and you when you were here. Help us to pause. Help us not just to listen, but to listen to understand. And when we find someone in a season of pain and grief, help us to enter into that with them. And that we might be blessed, but we can certainly understand where they're coming from and we can sing with them. And for those of us who are struggling right now, and it's so hard to watch other people being happy and blessed, help us to put aside that pain momentarily to rejoice in the fact that there are still good things happening in the world. That hope is not lost. Somehow weave our voices together into a beautiful choir that culminates with everything that has breath 